Everybody ready? Yep. Awesome sauce. Well, welcome everybody to tonight's Indivisible Town Hall. We're a large group tonight, so if you'd all be sure to mute your microphones, that'd be really helpful. Uh, we've enabled transcription, which you can toggle using the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. And now I will officially begin. Welcome to tonight's Indivisible Town Hall with Indivisible co-founder and co-director Ezra Levin. I'm your producer, Kat Pipkin. Special thanks tonight to Nina Masavi, Louise Pathé, Robin Gittleman, and Kevin Jones. And thanks to everybody for joining us, whether you're with us live via Facebook Live or YouTube, via the podcast or via terrestrial radio. We're so glad you're here. Before we begin, we wish to acknowledge that we live and work on the ancestral homelands of many indigenous peoples throughout the Pacific Northwest. And I will add, if you'd like to understand more about the land you occupy, we encourage you to visit the website native-land.ca. I'll put that in the chat and it will also be in the show notes. As many of you already know, Ezra's going to be coming here to Washington the weekend of October 8th and 9th to help us in some key congressional races. So tonight, we have a preview of what we'll be doing together to get us across the finish line in this year's midterm election, which is now just six weeks away. We know you have many questions for Ezra, so please feel free to submit them in the chat bar and we'll do our best to get to all of them. And with that, I'll turn things over to our moderator, Stephan Cox. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, everybody, for joining us here tonight. Uh, we were just saying before we uh, were getting started, this conversation could not be more aptly timed right now. As you mentioned, it is six weeks out. Um, Ezra, welcome, man. I, I, I feel like we're family at this point. So how are you? How, how is Zeke? How, how is Leah? How's everybody doing? We're, we're doing well. We're doing well. We, um, we're in Texas right now um, for the, the last part of the campaign. So we're going to be visit, visiting with groups here in Texas and using it as a jumping off point to go all around the country. Leah was just in uh, Southern California. She's going to uh, uh, Oregon next week. Then I'm, I'm coming to Washington. We're going to make a trip out to uh, Georgia, Michigan. All uh, We're going all over um, uh, and then doing a lot of virtual events to try to in these six weeks and run through the tape. That's the goal. So I'm, well, we'll get into it, but I, I'm feeling cautiously optimistic. Is that where we are? Well, let's let's get into how cautious and how optimistic. I'll go there. I'll go there with you. This is my meter, my cautiously optimistic meter. By the way, Kat said that she would like uh, some some baby and dog pictures before we leave, please. So just Great. so that's- I can, I can set that up. Okay, good. So listen, you know, you and I have talked, um, well, we were just mentioning that Indivisible is almost six years old now. So you and I have been talking for many years now, and we certainly talked in advance of the 2018 election. We talked in advance of the 2020 election about the stakes, right, yeah. for this country. And um, I would love for you to talk about the stakes as you see them for this year's election, how they compare, how they contrast, where we're at, how are you seeing it? Yeah, I, it's a trope in American politics that this is the most important election of our lifetimes. And yet, look, y'all, this is the most important election of our lifetimes. I don't know what else to say. What we are looking at right now is two very different possible worlds, a world where we lose and a world where we win. And what does that actually mean? So in, in a loss scenario, it means we're going to have a, uh, a, a House Speaker, Kevin McCarthy, a, a Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, um, what they're focused on is not policy. They're not actually looking to get anything done. Their goal is going to be to impeach Biden, to tie up the administration and investigations, and to pave the way for the coup that is already in process being driven at the state level with the support of the Supreme Court. I mean, that that's the path that we will be on, and we're going to be forced to do the best we can to build up the pro-democracy forces to prepare for that potential coup in 2024 should we lose the House or the Senate versus, so that's the dark scenario, versus this other potential scenario where we expand the Senate by one, two, three, four seats. We hold the House of Representatives and everything that Kirsten Sinema, Joe Manchin, and Mitch McConnell killed over the last 18 months is suddenly on the table. Automatic voter registration, getting money out of politics, ending gerrymandering, D.C. statehood, Puerto Rico self-determination, uh, lowering prescription drug prices further, addressing paid parental leave and child care and expanding access to health care and investing more in climate. Every like there was a massive agenda that we got some of some serious parts of this Congress, but all of the democracy bill was killed and much of the economic agenda was watered down. That's all back on the table. And we would then go into 2024, both having accomplished a huge amount on the social and economic 
side of things, but also strengthening our democracy and preventing both any coup and reducing the amount of voter suppression that is happening in red states like Arizona and Texas and Florida and Georgia. So I don't know. I Yes, look, 2018 was incredibly important. 2020 was incredibly important. You could envision two different worlds. Happens to be we won in 2018. We won in 2020. And so we've been on the better of the two paths in the last two elections. We have the chance to be on the better of the two paths in this one, too. You've contrasted things, I, I think, absolutely perfectly. And I really want to talk about a lot of the ways in which we uh, we get there, uh, particularly around messaging. I know you have a lot to say about that. So as Kat mentioned in the intro, you were coming out to Canvas on October 8th uh, to the 8th Congressional District, my home uh, district, and you're going to be here through the weekend. Um, as you said, you and, and, uh, and Lee are going to uh, be working with Indivisibles in, I believe it's a dozen states between now and the election, doing uh, in-person and virtual. Uh, why did you choose to come here to Washington in person? Uh, because I think it is hard to draw a line to a Democratic House majority that doesn't go through Washington's eighth and Washington's third. It is really difficult. It's not impossible, but it's tough. It is tough. If y'all win in the eighth and the third, we got a real shot of holding the house. That that means holding one seat and a pickup in another seat. We we don't have much of a margin in a the house. They have gerrymandered in several states. So in order for us to hold the house, we really do have to hold on to those tough districts like the eighth, which we we flipped in the blue wave. We held on to it in 2020, but it's a, it's a tough district this this cycle. We need to hold on to it again, and we need to flip some of these that we haven't been able to flip before. And I think we got a real chance in the third. So uh, I, I love Washington. We'd love to see y'all in person. That's not why I'm coming out. I'm coming out because the future of democracy depends on us winning these two districts. And I wanna do everything I can to help y'all ensure that we do win those districts. I want to provide a little more context uh, for what you're talking about, and most people who are on the call are going to know about this, but we're focusing on these two congressional races with two great candidates. Uh, we have incumbent Dr. Kim Schreier in eighth in a seat that uh, Indivisibles helped to flip in 2018. Uh, it's in your book. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's something that we, uh, we, we've documented. And uh, uh, Marie Glusenkamp Perez in CD3 is running against a Trump backed MAGA Republican after uh, incumbent Jamie Herrera Butler failed to advance, uh, most likely because of her vote to impeach Trump after January 6th. Wow, what a what a thought. So, you know, as I said, we're going to get into some real specifics here. But just generally speaking, what are some of the fundamentals that you're going to be focusing on uh, when you're here to win in these two districts? Well, look, I, I've got a lot of thoughts. Um, about political strategy and messaging, but my most foundational thought is that you all are the experts. I'm, I'm flying in from out of town. So you all know the district, you know the community better than I'm going to know it. Um, at a, at a 30,000 foot level, though, when I look at what's happening in red, blue, and purple states and how the Democratic Party, uh, led by Joe Biden, is responding to this moment, what I see is a, a pretty clear directive. And, and that's different than what I saw in 2010. I was a House staffer in 2010. We had passed Dodd-Frank. We had passed the Affordable Care Act. We had passed the stimulus. We'd had a pretty robust legislative agenda. And in 2010, at this time, we all knew we were doomed. We all knew we were doomed. It felt like the wave from the Republicans was coming. It felt like there was no unified message. It didn't feel like we had a political strategy headed in. And we were just bracing for impact. Now, what we hear is we get Biden's speech three weeks ago, would have liked to see him give it a year ago, but he gave a brilliant speech three weeks ago, setting out the stakes and what this election is actually about. And he said it very clear, this isn't an election between Republicans and Democrats. This is an election between MAGA extremists who are attacking our schools, our communities, and our very democracy, and everybody else. Yeah. He drew a circle around him and the 70% of the population that doesn't want to ban abortion, that doesn't want to ban contraception, that doesn't support bloody coups, that doesn't think teachers are pedophiles, that isn't scared of their kids being indoctrinated by, uh, 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 by public schools. And I think that's the right way to approach this election in most communities. Now, what specific issue is driving in your community? Is it the attack on our democracy? Is it the attack on abortion? Is it the attack on schools? You know, I, I'm open. I, I, and I, I don't have a direct preference there. I think you all being in the community are best situated to figure out what's going to resonate the most. But I do think the overarching frame of it's not Republican versus Democrat. It's scary extremists 
who is coming after you versus just normal folks who want to make your lives better. And they do that through student debt relief. They do that through the Inflation Reduction Act. They do that through stimulus. They do that through lowering your prescription drug costs. And they do that through the agenda that they would like to get done if they're empowered. Seems smart to me. You're hitting on something so fundamental. And in fact, uh, the race in the third that we've talked about here, Michelle Goldberg in the New York Times had just a spot on piece talking about how this is just a microcosmic view of what we are facing here in the country. And I, I will ask you to get a little specific about um, the way that you look at reaching and not about the people in the third, but really just about the way that we need to, and it's a very small sliver of this electric, uh, electorate, uh, that we need to win over some non-Trump Republicans to keep a MAGA Republican out of office. How do you think generally about the challenge of reaching those kinds of voters? Yeah, I mean, I, elections are about choices fundamentally. So what is the choice that will win over these non-MAGA Republicans over to our side? In Pennsylvania, they have identified Republican women with extremely high pro-abortion scores. And they are writing postcards and reaching out to these Republican women because they recognize that while we not, might not agree on, on many social and economic issues, we do agree on this fundamental attack on our, on our human rights. While we might not be on the same page when it comes to taxes or healthcare or immigration, I, whatever it might be, we can agree that bloody coups are bad, <laughs> that attacking <laughs> teachers and calling them pedophiles is yeah. bad, that yeah. forcing children who um, are impregnated by their relatives and raped to go across state lines in order to get health care is bad. That's the reality we're living in. The the and, and I happen to believe that that's true. Like these people who might have voted Republicans in your past, they are more aligned with us now than they are aligned with the folks who are in charge of the Republican Party. And I would like to see us build a robust 70% of the population pro-democracy coalition to kick MAGA out of power. And then let's go back to fighting each other on these specific issues. I don't agree with Liz Cheney on 99% of her policy agenda. Never have. I became politically active during the aftermath of September 11th and the Iraq war. Her father was the villain in my political cosmology. And, and mine real, too. <laughs> yeah. Look, uh, and, and I think she's been a real hero. She's actually stepped up and put aside her differences largely with the Democrats in order to stand up for the democracy. And I think most Republicans who are not members of Congress actually agree with us on this. And you see this in the polling on much of the issues. The things that the Republicans are pushing now effectively through undemocratic means like the Supreme Court are rejected by the vast majority of people. So the short version, how do we reach um, independence and how do we reach soft Republicans, non-MAGA Republicans? I think we talk to them about what the stakes are. Do they think abortion should be illegal? Do they think that contraception should be illegal? Do they think that teachers are pedophiles? Do they think that the elections are illegitimate? If they do, they're not with us. And look, right, right, right. They, they have a right to vote. They can vote the way they want to. But the vast majority of them are with us. And if we're able to define the election in those terms, that's a choice between those two things, then we win. If if the other side is able to define the election in their terms, which is look at these scary immigrants who are here, or look at your look at your communities. You got to be scared about brown and black people who are coming after you, or look at these overly woke bureaucrats who are indoctrinating your children. That's the real issue. If they if they succeed in defining the election in those terms, we're sunk. Yeah. But that's a fantasy that they're trying to create, and the reality of people's lives right now is. The Republican extremism, uh, extremism is directly affecting them. We're seeing this throughout the country with these just medieval abortion bans. That the law in the books in Arizona is from 1864. 1864. The Republicans have turned the clock back to the 19th century when it comes to abortion laws, not through democratic means, but through a MAGA pack Supreme Court. I think sometimes in elections it's tough to describe the choices it's, it's almost abstract you're talking about what you'll promise to do and what the other side is threatening to do and you'll try to make it real for folks we don't have to do that now it's real we're looking at it square in the face that the impact of their extremism is on the front pages across the country and it's terrible and there's a real human cost to that but there could be political consequences to that too so then let me ask you about 
and, and I, I, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm searching for the right word, and I think maybe proportionality is, is really the word that I'm looking for, because I think, you know, there is a danger that if we push too hard on one particular issue, that it, it may backfire. And, and we, we hear this from political consultants and take that with a, a massive truck full of salt. But, you know, the, we have seen a huge surge in women registering to vote, of course. Um, but polling sh shows that it is losing some ground as an issue. And so how do you think we keep the momentum up on this issue until November? Look, so I think of, you know, when I think of what we can do between now and November, six weeks, we got six weeks, right? There, there are yeah. two broad categories of work that we can do. One is the traditional voter contact work, which I think is really important, it's foundational. Indivisibles contacted, we reached out to 72 million voters in the 2018 cycle and 2020 cycle, 72 million. That's a, a mix of text banking, phone banking, canvassing. Um, postcarding um, in order to get out the vote. And that's necessary. You got to do that in order to get out the vote because nothing is better at getting out the vote than voters talking to voters. We know that every study, every campaign will tell you that. So we've got to do that. That's one thing we can do. And so the example of, you know, calling soft non-MAGA Republicans or calling independents and, and telling them about the stakes of this election and what's actually on the line, what the policy differences are. I think that's important. But the other thing that I think indivisible groups specifically as community institutions that have been developing their legitimacy for six years are well situated to do is to force this issue into the front pages as much as we possibly can. And we see this happening throughout the country. So in Pennsylvania, there's a, a, a quote unquote moderate Republican representative who is somewhat moderate on gun violence prevention, but an extremist on, on abortion issues, on abortion rights. And the indivisible groups there are making it their job to make him famous for his extremism on abortion. They don't wanna see him skate by on his uh, supposedly moderate record. His goal is to be seen as the reasonable Republican who you might not agree with on everything, but come on, he's a good guy. You can vote for him. Our goal is to say, well, you're voting for Kevin McCarthy for Speaker of the House. You're voting for a national abortion ban. That's not a reasonable guy. That's not a moderate guy. This is an extremist and somebody who's enabling extremists and people who are attacking our democracy. So getting creative and using your local uh, authority and credibility in order to force the issues that I believe are the most important issues of the day on the front pages. I think locally led groups like indivisible locals all over the country are, are well situated to do that. It's going to look different in every place. Sure. So we, we see people putting up wanted posters for, for representatives named by the January 6th commission. We saw some indivisibles dressing up in, in giant broccoli costumes to highlight the crudite fiasco of Dr. Oz. I don't know what it's going to be. And I'm not the one to direct it, but getting creative, figuring out how you're going to get press and attention on the issues in the way you want to get the attention. Uh, I think y'all are well situated to do that in addition to this foundational get out the vote voter contact work that's necessary. So you have mentioned the uh, the the concern that everybody shares on this call about the threats posed to our democracy. I, I'm wondering, I'll, I'll ask you this, as you have been out talking with voters going door to door, are you finding that swing voters share this concern? And if not, are there things that you feel that we can and should be doing to start to alert them in a way that might potentially move their vote? Yeah, well, I, I see a, abortion um, as resonating in on many of the doorsteps that I that I've gone to, and in many of the calls and texts that I've um, made and sent, so I, I do see that issue rising to the top. I do see some worry about generally Republican extremism, but I, I, I wouldn't lead with Republican extremism. That's the that's the mm -hmm. meta frame, but it's pretty abstract. That that is the the moral of the story is they are extremists, but the specific problem that you're solving for is their attack on abortion rights, their attack on schools, their attack on our democracy, and I am agnostic as to which of those issues is the one we ought to push on. I think we should use the data we have and the message testing we have to push on whichever issue in your particular community is going to resonate the most, and what works in Washington eighth is going to be different than what works in rural Pennsylvania, which is going to be different than what works in Phoenix. Sure. And that's fine. That's fine. Um, we are at Indivisible. We're not, I, I do not 
pretend to be a national messaging shop. That that is not what we do. We're not we're not pollsters. What sure. we try to do is organize people power in order to put the attention on the extremism of the other side and to do the kind of person to person vote of contact. So again, I. I would be pretty deferential to what y'all decide is the thing to push on. I will say you should be confident that you are in the majority when you push on contraception, when you push on abortion rights, when you push on these attacks on teachers, when you push on these attacks on democracy, we have the majority position. They have a deeply unpopular minority position. So then the question is for you all, what is going to resonate the most? And again, defer to you. The Republicans re recently released their slate of, of policy issues, which um, are uh, pretty thin soup, I think. It's, uh, I think it's fair to yeah. say. Um, you know, and despite that, we hear from voters on the doors that uh, Democrats haven't accomplished anything, right? Uh, which is, I think, ironic in the extreme, considering that, that the Biden administration, by my lights, has uh, achieved more in its first term than many other presidencies in modern history. The infrastructure package, the bipartisan gun legislation, historic job creation, Inflation Reduction Act with historic climate legislation, uh, free shots and millions of arms, the, the CHIPS Act, on and on and on and on. Is there anything that you think is worth us trying to correct the record when we come across somebody who is like, I'm ready to throw the bums out because they haven't gotten anything done? Is it worth countering that uh, with people when, when you encounter that on the doors? Oh, absolutely. I mean, and I wouldn't do it in a, it doesn't need to be a conflictual way. Um, I think there there's a natural... Um, there's a natural skepticism of federal government because it's um, it, it is constrained by its inefficiencies and its and the corruption of the system itself. Um, and despite all that, I think you're exactly right. The Biden administration has actually accomplished a lot of extremely popular and very large policies under these during these first two years. So you name some of the issues and depending on who I was talking to, I might name some or uh, might name some others. If you were coming across an apathetic college student or a recent college graduate who thought that the whole system is rigged and why, why should he or she show up to vote? I would say, well, Biden just forgave $400 billion in student debt. How about that? If you're talking to somebody who's going to be relying on um, Medicare and Social Security, you can talk to them about what Biden's doing in order to lower prescription drug costs and to lower the cost of insulin. If you're talking to somebody who cares about the crumbling infrastructure, you can talk about the bipartisan infrastructure bill. If you're talking to somebody who cares about climate, talk about the single largest climate bill in all of American history. I mean, these are big agendas. And I wouldn't just talk about what has been passed. I would talk about what is the opportunity? What are they voting for? So right. great, they did those things, but what else is on the table? Well, Kirsten Cinema unilaterally rejected any kind of increase on of taxes on the wealthy. She said, nope, we're not gonna raise taxes on the wealthy. You give us 52 Senate votes and we're gonna able, be able to further flight inflation by raising taxes on the wealthy and invest in things like paid parental leave or childcare or expanded pre-K. There are more things that we would like to do, and if empowered with a couple more senators and holding the House, we're going to be able to do it. The other side, you said it, thin soup. I mean, is there any soup? It's just water, if that, and it's evaporated. I mean, there's nothing. The bowl's, the bowl's empty. It's bare. There's nothing there. They have talking points. There's no policy agenda. Name me one piece of policy that they're actually going to put through. Well, I'll name it. They're going to cut taxes for their donors again. That's what they want to do. They might try to repeal the ACA again. They've made some noise about trying to dismantle Social Security and Medicare. So that's their agenda. Well, and the other half of their agenda is scaring the bejesus out of you by talking about figments of your imagination. Can I ask you about that? Because that was where I was going to go next. I mean, so they're playing the hits right now, right? Mm -hmm. So we're mm -hmm. hearing concerns about public safety and crime, yep. even from people who admit that it's not impacting them personally. Um, and uh, what, for, first of all, you know, we know that Republicans will always try to scare voters with crime because, as Dan Pfeiffer said in a recent Substack, it's a proxy for race. Mm -hmm. um, another one of the Republicans' greatest hits now is immigration. Yep. Uh, Ron DeSantis is stunt flying uh, immigrants to Martha's Vineyard. I think we can expect a lot more of this fear mongering between now and November. Uh, I would ask you why you think this is such a go-to for Republicans because it didn't work in 2018 with the uh, with, with the, the you know the, the groups coming uh, across the border in 2018 and it didn't work with um, S13 in in uh, 2020. But I wonder wh what do you do when these sorts of things come up? Is it a is it a matter of pivoting away? Is it a matter of sort of hearing the concerns? How do you how how do you generally think about this? 
Yeah, well, I, you're exactly right that they're playing the greatest hits. And I they do it because they don't actually have a popular proactive agenda that they, they will actually push. So instead of saying, hey, we want to cut taxes for the wealthy, or hey, we want to dismantle Social Security, give us power, we'll dismantle Social Security. Don't you want that? They're not going to say that on the doors. They're not going to cut ads that say that. That's not popular. They can't say that. So they got to figure out how they can change the subject, both from their proposed policy agenda, but also from the policy agenda that they've already enacted, right? They're not going out talking about their abortion ban. They're not going out talking about the con the, the threat of a contraceptive ban or to um, to end same-sex marriages. That, that That's not what they're going out on the doors to talk about. So they've got to figure out a way, what can we get press about? What can we what can we focus attention on? The reason why they pulled this stunt um, sending Venezuelan immigrants over to Martha's Vineyard is, is both because they are cruel, but but actually there's a political purpose to it. And it's to get headlines about immigration because they would much rather talk about immigration, even if it's them being cruel about immigration. They would much rather, oh, Republicans are hard on immigrants like that. Sure, they love that story. They'll take it because that's a day that they're not talking about them, their their agenda restricting abortion or their agenda cutting taxes or their agenda attacking social security. So it, it is a strategy. I wouldn't say it doesn't work. I think it can be quite effective. And for all of us engaging in this political debate in real time, I think what we've got to do is explain the tactic, explain what they're doing and say, look, they don't have an actual policy agenda. What they are doing is trying to divide and conquer you so that they can jam down your throat these deeply unpopular policies that they're already doing. They are already implementing abortion bans. They are already attacking contraceptive access. They are already attacking healthcare access and social security. This is what they are doing in real time. The reason why you don't hear them talking about that, and they're talking about immigration or trans kids in sports or teachers being pedophiles or books that need to be burned or banned, they're doing that to distract so that they can entrench their own power and do more of this really unpopular stuff. There's a reason why in Texas and in Georgia and Wisconsin and elsewhere, they 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 come after abortion rights. And at the same time, they come after democracy. They suppress the votes and they look to subvert the election because they want power to do unpopular things and they don't want to face the voters. So I, I do think explaining what the other side is doing and then pivoting to, and here's what we would like to do. Mm -hmm. We would like paid parental leave. We would like paid sick leave. We would like expanded child care support. We would like to address inflation even further by raising taxes on the wealthy and investing in these things. We would like to address climate even more. We would like to save our democracy, strengthen our institutions, all these popular things that most people want. I think that's the one-two punch. Explain their tactics, explain that they have a deeply unpopular agenda that they're trying to distract from, and then pivot to, and here's what we'll actually do. And to your earlier point, I think We've got some credibility saying what we're going to do because we've accomplished so much on just about any issue that most Americans care about. You can point to some massive policy accomplishment over the past 18 months, not a full policy accomplishment. It's not everything that we wanted to get, but real substantive progress that we could build on if given a couple more years. I have a specific question about that, and uh, it, it, it has to do with our last six years as an organization. Um, Indivisible is almost six years old. Um, first and foremost, I will just ask you, that is a lot of time. Um, you and Leah now have a family, uh, in addition to now running one of the, the most influential grassroots organizations in the country. How are you holding up <laughs> over these last six years? You know, it, uh, th this is my favorite thing to do, talking mm -hmm. to real leaders on the ground who are actually building this power. Uh, so this is quite energizing to me. And I, I feel like we, we've we not finished this fight for democracy. We're right in the middle of it. I think it's it's incredible to think, you know, we, this is our third election cycle that we've gone through. And at the beginning of each election cycle, it really didn't look like we were going to win. You know, in early 2017, well, the House is gerrymandered. You got Donald Trump. There's no way that you're going to be able to to to, to flip the House. And we did at the beginning of the presidential cycle. When was the last president? It's been over a generation since a president failed to win re-election. How are you going to be able to do this with all the Republican forces and the uh, and the MAGA hat wearing zealots who are out there? It's not going to be possible. And we did it. Then immediately after that, well, you're not going to flip two Senate seats in Georgia. Get out of here. Give up. Go home. There's no legislative agenda. And we did it and started this cycle. And just a foregone conclusion after democracy uh, was defeated by Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin in January of this year. Well, 
looks like the Democrats didn't accomplish anything. It's a midterm election. You're definitely going to lose. And here we are six weeks from the election. I think most people give the Democrats a greater chance of holding the House than they give Republicans of taking the Senate. It doesn't mean it's a foregone conclusion. I think they're it's a realistic scenario that Democrats lose the House and the Senate. It's a realistic scenario that we hold the Senate and lose the House. It's a realistic scenario that we expand the Senate margins and hold the House. All of those are possible. And so the thing that keeps me going is that we live in this incredible time where there are multiple possible futures and we can actually impact which future is realized. How incredible is that? That's not been true in every election since I've been paying attention to politics. It's certainly not been true in every election in modern American history. Usually you can guess what's going to happen. People don't know. So the kind of work that we're doing now, the kind of work that we're talking about now, God, you got to feel part of history right now being uh, being in this movement, fighting for democracy, because um, because we are. We are we are creating that history right now. So I, I'm jazzed up by that. I, I really am. Um, and it's not all high. I mean, after democracy, I was as down in the dumps as anybody here. I was committed to getting that through. And I was incredibly, I was out in, in Phoenix with indivisible groups from across Arizona, marching with the, the King family, um, asking Kirsten Cinema to not betray their father's legacy. Um, and then she betrayed their father's legacy. Um, I was pissed off. I was angry and I was worried about what was to come. And the thing that helped me in that moment was calling around to indivisible group leaders all across the country. And their response was pretty uniform, like, God, that sucks. And now here's this election we're working on, or we're going to do this event later, and we've really got to build up for us so we can protect the, the majorities in the midterms. And I think that's that's all we can do. You can give up or you can keep on building. And right now, in this moment, I think that mentality of, well, we lost that one, let's keep on building, it, it's proving to be the right strategy again and again, because we've got a real fighting chance to win this thing. And then if we do, we've got this huge opportunity next year to do so much good. Um, so I, I'm in it and I, I'm not gonna step back as long as the, there's a danger of Trump wielding power again. Um, and that'll fuel me for quite some time. You mentioned Kirsten Cinema, and you know, I think a lot of people have a hard time connecting the dots between everything that I talked about earlier, all of the achievements of the Biden administration um, and what has really been indivisible special sauce, which is constituent pressure. Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema were impervious to it, right? They did not respond to constituent pressure at all, right up to, you know, people rafting out to the, you know, the, um, the almost heaven, uh, you know, to try to, uh, you know, give uh, uh, Joe Manchin uh, some personal pressure there. I, I will just ask you, do you still feel that constituent pressure works in the way that you want it to? Yeah, I, it's such a good question. Um, and I would say constituent power works in some ways and work and doesn't work in other ways. It works in some contexts and it doesn't work in other contexts. If you look at what happened with Kirsten Cinema, she is one of the most unpopular uh, Democrats mm -hmm. in the country now, one of the most unpopular elected officials in the country. She is detested by independents, Republicans, and Democrats alike in Arizona. Um, not the choices I would have made if I were an elected senator looking to run for re-election. A normal thing for a senator who is up in a tough re-election race to do is to listen to his or her constituency, figure out how to build the coalition in order to win, make those choices, try to please as many people as possible, and then move forward. Instead, cinema has pursued a strategy to seems to be make as many people mad as possible. I, yeah, right. It, 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 it is absolutely flummoxing. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I would say she she in some ways is the exception because you see in most districts this kind of pressure play out pretty well. But I wouldn't say constituent pressure has failed in cinema's case. Most people believe that she is going to have an extremely difficult time winning a Democratic primary when she is up in 2024. We took a vote of indivisible group members in Arizona, and we have a particularly strong network in Arizona. They're in every congressional district. I think there are 67 local groups. Um, I think we had 94% say that they would support primarying her. Um, it's just uniform support. Um, so I, I think... Kirsten Cinema is likely ending her career and is selling out to be a lobbyist or a talking head on Fox News or something, something of that kind. So maybe she'll run again or maybe she'll lose. But you look at what the constituent pressure did over the course of this year. 
It unified the Progressive Caucus to fight for a large Build Back Better bill, most of which we didn't get, but some of which we did. Why did Joe Manchin, who is a coal baron, agree to the single largest climate bill in American history? Why did he do that? It didn't come out of thin air. It came because- Why do you Caucus think he did that? That has been on the top of my mind, and I cannot figure it out for the life of me. What do you think? Um, I think uh, he didn't. So Joe Manchin is not a Republican. He is not a Republican. And a, as much as I um, uh, disagree with Joe Manchin on many things, I would say you replace Joe Manchin in West Virginia with any other elected official, they're going to be a MAGA Republican. He, he is acting like a much more progressive center than you would expect to come out of West Virginia. Cannot say the same thing about Kirsten Sinema. We see Kelly in Arizona, who is a Democrat elected statewide in Arizona, who is behaving like a reasonable, moderately conservative Democrat, but who will vote for Joe Biden's agenda and who will support democracy reform and filibuster reform. Kirsten Sinema isn't acting that way. But Joe Manchin actually did indeed engage in negotiations with the Progressive Caucus, demanded his pound of flesh out of the bill, demanded a lot of bad stuff, but ultimately did want to get some stuff done and was willing to go along with the demands of the progressives and the rest of the caucus in order to get it done. Um, and look, I think that's I think that's laudable. That's great. Cinema, on the other hand, just seems to want to burn the whole place down. Now, in making cinema deeply unpopular, we increase the chances that we replace cinema with a better Democrat. And I think our pathway to safeguarding our democracy and passing the kind of social and economic policies that I think we all want to see involves getting more and better Democrats. There's not other, there's no other secret sauce. That's just what we've got to do. So did constituent yeah. pressure fail in Arizona? In one respect, yeah, I wanted to reform the filibuster and pass democracy reform. That was my top choice. I don't particularly want to primary cinema. I don't have it out for her. If she had voted with us, I would be cheering her on. She didn't. And as a result of her not voting and as a result of this grassroots energy from across her state, she is now deeply unpopular and it's going to be more difficult for her, her to hold office. And other Democratic senators and other representatives who are watching her are viewing her as a cautionary tale. So on one hand, failed to get the legislation done. On the other hand, built power in a way that makes our job easier in the future. And over the course of that fight, the, the democracy fight, we moved 48 out of 50 Democrats over to our side on filibuster reform. When we started talking about this, I remember talking with Elizabeth Warren um, before she announced her presidential run. She wasn't even out on filibuster reform yet then. She hadn't come out saying there was a reform. So we didn't, we didn't accomplish the legislation that we wanted to see earlier this year, but we pulled the entire Democratic Party minus a couple of stragglers along with us. And if we pull it out in November, if we do indeed maintain our majorities in the House and expand the Senate, look, we, we've, we've plowed the, the ground, we've planted the seeds, we've prepared for the harvest to come. We just got to make it there. Um, so I do think it's more complicated than early on in the visible 2017, where you could just show up at your congressional district and say, hey, I'm mad about this. And folks were like, oh, my gosh, who are these people? Maybe I need to worry about them. People know who Indivisible is now. People have a better idea of what their districts are. So we've got to get creative about how we best apply that pressure. Uh, it's not always going to be direct. You get the legislation you want. You get the vote you want. It might be a longer game. But I don't think what we've seen in the last six years is that the power, get constituent power has been relegated to the sidelines. I think we've seen it play out with, with serious impact repeatedly. You're touching around the, 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 the edges of, of an issue that Kat and I have been thinking a lot about in terms of indivisible evolution and, and where we are right now. And you had just touched on uh, how earlier you, you felt that when you needed to be energized, that you would, you would check in with groups and, and that there was this, this groundswell of energy. And, you know, it, it, it occurs to me that we started as, and this is me, uh, my observation, is largely an anti-Trump organization. And since then, we have become kind of a de facto pro-democracy organization and really one of the only kind of its left, uh, of its kind left standing in, uh, you know, in, in the field since the 2016 election. And in fact, I will note that a lot of local democratic organizations now come to Indivisible when they are looking to uplift and amplify candidates and events, which I think is a real testament to our power. Um, but I will also mention that the corollary is that membership that is still with us is having to shoulder more and more of this burden because there are fewer of us. And quite frankly, I know that people are just exhausted. And 
on this hour. I think folks on, on the call would love to hear your thoughts, certainly on the work that we have done and accomplished, but also um, how we keep going and what the path forward looks like. I've hit you with a lot. Take as much time as you need. And I know that my uh, my internet uh, connection is a little unstable. Did you miss any part of my question there? I, I, the question, is, so I, just to repeat back to you, is the, the question is about retention and recruitment. How do we keep going for the long haul, recognizing that this isn't some kind of, that this isn't going to be over in November. This might not be over in February. This might not be over in 2024. How do we think about um, maintaining the movement in the long term? Is that is that the basic? Yeah, it's the basic, yeah. Uh, Look, it's tough. I think, why, why is Indivisible still here six years later? Why, why do we still exist? Why are there thousands of groups across the country who are still active and still meeting? Uh, I, I don't, I, look, I'm proud of the Indivisible guide uh, that we wrote. I think it was a nice guide. I don't think that's why we're all still here. Um, I, I think there were some smart strategies and tactics outlined in that. I think the reason why, Indi and, and I'm proud of Indivisible, the organization that's supporting groups all across the country, but I think that the, the beating heart of the Indivisible movement is the group-based organizing structure that has been set up. It is not owned by me. It's not owned by Indivisible National. It's owned by you all. You've built communities on the ground who have made as part of your identity that you're fighters for democracy, that you actually show up and make this democracy work. Um, and I think as long as indivisibles are able to continue building up leadership and recruiting new members and allowing some people to take a break, and it can be a month long break and be a years long break, um, but come back when re-energized, re we can sustain this. Now, the question then is how do you actually pull people in? How are you able to pull people in? Because it can't just be on your shoulders. The strongest indivisible groups are ones that have a, you know, half a dozen or a dozen different members of the leadership team who are all taking different pieces and they're constantly pulling new people in. Indivisible groups that are led by just one single leader are inherently less stable because the natural course of individual activism is you get really into it and you carry it as much as you can, but eventually your activism wanes, it goes down and that's natural. It's natural. Look, you get a new job, you have kids, you move, life happens, whatever. But activism wane. So are you able to build strong communities where you're constantly pulling new people in and constantly developing their leadership so folks can drop off? Because that drop off is going to happen. You're never going to eliminate drop off. And the best tactics that I've seen for doing that is uh, are, are um, methodical and opportunistic. Methodical in the sense that you're constantly celebrating your wins. You're, you're figuring out how to celebrate together and have fun doing this work. If this is a slog, if you're always banging your head against the wall, if you're always just in this impending sense of doom that the world is going to come apart, that's all reasonable. Don't get me wrong. I feel that from time to time. But if that's the experience of participating in politics for you, you're going to burn out. If you can't find joy in this work, if you can't figure out a way to be a happy warrior, if you can't figure out a way to nurture a community, um, it's going to be tough to keep going and more people aren't going to want to join because people don't like doing sad stuff. People like doing fun stuff. People like being part of communities. And so how do you get people to come in and be part of your community? <laughs> I think you got to meet people where they are. Sometimes those opportunities are presented to us. For instance, when the Republicans, you know, gut a 50 year precedent at the Supreme Court level and, and ban abortions nationwide. I think that activates some people who were never activated before. So the overreach so from the- I other may side. have locked up entirely. Oh no. Stefan, can you hear me? Yeah, I, I may have locked up entirely. The, am, am I locking up? Are, are you guys having trouble hearing me at all? Um, okay, so Kat, what I'm going to do right now- <laughs> Okay. Ezra you, was. You can really hear me. You're having strong. trouble hearing Ezra. No, no, you, no. Ezra was really going strong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. So, 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 Kat, here's what I would love to do. I'm going to reset my connection. Would you mind starting in on the Q and A? Yeah, no problem. Terrific, and I'll be back in just a second. Great. Oh, okay. just, so just, just to end that, just yeah. to, just to close that thought real quick. Uh, so pulling people in in those moments. So there, there are these, and we see this, we've seen this over the last six years, bad stuff will happen. Some number of people who have not been engaged before lift their head up and say, oh my gosh, what is happening? I've got to do something. And the fact that there is a, a, a canvas in, uh, uh, in Washington's 8th on October 8th at 10 a.m. that they can go and join and it's not scary. They, um, there's a group of people who they identify with. That's useful. That means they can plug directly in that. If there's no way to get your hooks into them in that moment, that energy is going to dissipate. They're going to they're going to then 
turn their head back down. They're going to look at their phone. They're going to turn on the TV, whatever it is. So I do think it is incumbent on us to figure out how do we get our hooks into people in these opportunistic moments when they actually are engaged, they are scared, they want to be part of a community that's fighting back. Um, and we can't always predict when those moments are come, but the institutions that y'all have been building on the ground are great at actually being able to pull people in. So that's why, again, this is why I think Indivisible still exists six years later, because y'all have built these institutions. Okay, I'll I'm, show you that. Kat, I, I think I'm, am I back in? Am I, am I doing okay? Kevin, yeah, we can hear you. Sweet. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. Stephen Wilhelm. Hi, Stephen. How are you, brother? Uh, from Snohomish County Indivisible asks, uh, Republicans are rolling out their standard anti-immigration scare focus to distract from issues uh, that work for us, MAGA extremism in the economy. Uh, what what approach would you recommend to address anti- Well, <laughs> I just jumped right back into that. And Stephen, I hope to your satisfaction that we were able to uh, address that. Um, uh, a little bit earlier. Um, let's see, Tom Slayton asks, what do you think of referring to the other side, the anti-choice side as the anti-birth control side or refer to them as the religious police in Iran? Any any thoughts on, on that messaging? So when we, uh, we have worked with other folks who are not us, who are messaging experts who have done a lot of pulling a couple of different groups. And you'll see starting in the late spring, if you were paying attention to like my Twitter feed or any of the newsletters, you would have seen me. I started just talking about Republican extremism, and I shifted almost entirely to talking about MAGA Republicans. And you'll notice that uh, Joe Biden also talked about MAGA Republicans in his speech three weeks ago. The reason that you'll see that commonality of language between me and different members of the Democratic Party is because we've all seen the same polling and message testing research that shows that that frame is particularly effective at not just unifying Democrats, but peeling off non-MAGA Republicans and turning off the Republicans or turning off independents to the Republican Party because everybody knows what a MAGA Republican is. They can picture the tiki torches. They can mm -hmm. picture the assault on the Capitol. It's an easy shorthand way to get at who you are talking about. And this is a serious benefit. The other side can't reject the frame. They right. can't reject the frame because their cult leader, Donald Trump, would, would crucify them if they were to do that. So they can't say, no, I'm not MAGA Republican. They've got to say, damn right, I'm MAGA Republican, and then their support goes down. So it's right. a it's a beautiful messaging strategy that I think communicates succinctly what we're talking about and does an effective job of, again, drawing a circle around us and the 70% of the population that does not like MAGA. So I, I, I find that convincing, the data I've seen, and there's a lot of public data on this, and we did a training on this on a national convening recently. Happy to send stuff around, but that's why you'll see me use that language um, and why you see a lot of Democrats use that language. So, as I say, you are coming here on October 8th. You're going to be here through the weekend. Tell us what activities you have lined up. What's going oh, on? I can't wait. So we're going to be knocking on doors for Kim Schreier um, on October 8th, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, hopefully uh, somebody's going to share a link that uh, folks can join. This is on Saturday. That Please will be come out. Yep. It's going to be gorgeous outside. We're going to have a great time knocking on doors. We're going to chat. We're going to build community. It's going to be fun. It's going to be great. And we're going to be knocking on doors of people who are mainly with us. This isn't scary stuff. This is going talking to your community members who are with us, who don't like MAGA, who want to see them lose, who want to see us be able to accomplish everything we want to accomplish. So I think it'll be a lot of fun. Um, and then on Sunday from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., we're going to be doing a postcarding party, um, and that's in Tacoma. Um, so if for whatever reason you can't make the, the canvassing uh, on Saturday, or if you just can't get enough of me and you just really want to hang out some more, please come out to Tacoma. We can write some postcards together. We can have some fun, have some conversations. Um, uh, really excited to do this. Again, like I said, best thing. We know this from campaigns. We know this from academic research. Knocking on doors, voters talking to voters, and postcarding, telling people where they can vote. There is data behind this. There was a big study after the last election showing the impact of postcards really does reveal um, you, you can indeed move voters purely by sending them a handwritten note. It's great stuff. It has impact, and you can have a lot of fun doing it. So again, uh, Saturday, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, for Kim Schreier, and then Sunday, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. in Tacoma. Folks get to hang out with you. They get to come and interact with other groups. Uh, our state organizer, yes. Nina, will be there all weekend. Nina, um, and come ha hang out with the state organizers. It's really going to be a great event. You know, I have something that I've I've wanted to ask you for a number of years. Uh -oh. You 
uh, and, and this is actually something that I have just been so impressed by. So I know that you were not expecting the original guide to take off the way that it did. But once it did, like the next thing you know, you're on Rachel. And then you're on Time's most 100 influential list. And, and it seemed like you stepped into the role kind of like you were just born to it. W was there a, a learning curve for, for you? How, how, how did that ramp up for you? I mean, it was why I mean, Lee and I both um, I mean, we didn't hardly sleep or eat for the first three months of 2017. Uh, our house was a mess. It was it was a wreck. Um, uh, but, you know, I think this this leadership has been easy because I'm not the leader of this movement. Um, I'm not the only person that's making an invisible national run there. The, this is a movement of leaders. I mean, I am very quick to say that the reason I am here is because you all are building something real. The reason Indivisible is still here six years later is because y'all are leading this. I wrote a Google Doc, okay? I mean, that yes, I, I'm, again, proud of the Google Doc. Happy it spread. Happy it energized a lot of folks and people took lessons from it and built up Indivisible groups. But the magic of Indivisible is not me. It really isn't. The magic of Indivisible is that you all are building up a pro-democracy force that is real and sustained. So, I think that took a lot of the pressure off, Stefan. I really do. I think it made it easy. Y'all made it easy. Um, and I feel just such a sense of community being in, it doesn't matter if I'm talking to indivisibles in Louisiana or Alabama or California or Washington, we all share this same common goal, this perspective on life, this, this dedication to addressing the threats that are real and present in our society. And um, I, I can't tell you just how, how much of an honor or privilege and, and a joy and a real joy it is to be doing this. Well, we appreciate you. We appreciate your leadership. Uh, we appreciate you always being here to uplift. I mean, when we need you, you come and you just, yeah, you, you really uh, lift, a, you, you, you put window into a lot of sales and we just, we very much appreciate you. Uh, any final words before we, before we go? Well, let's win this thing. Let's do it. And please come out, come out on the 8th and the 9th. Uh, come out with me. Let's contact some voters. Let's make sure the MAGA does not entrench its power. Let's see if we can pass D.C. statehood, get money out of politics, in gerrymandering, enact more of Biden's legislative agenda. This is all on the table. It's ours for the taking. My God, it's ours for the taking. We can do it. <laughs> and we're going to do it by winning the 3rd and the 8th. That's how we're going to do it. And I'm going to be out there helping y'all. So and please come out. Can't wait to see y'all. And one last request, even just if it's on your phone, uh, baby and, and puppy pictures, oh, yeah. if, if, okay, if you wait. please. And while you're here, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll fill for time. To, to... <laughs> He's getting some Steve. baby pictures. Oh, it's Zeke. Oh, no. Oh, That's actually, picture. you know what? This is his one year birthday, and he oh, turns man. two in three weeks. So I've, I've got to upgrade my background photo. Here you go. <laughs> Oh my God, he's just so adorable. adorable. Yeah. He's you the best. I got to say, he he is just the best. He he goes, yeah, I can, he's turning too. I can count on one hand the number of times he hasn't slept from 7.30 uh, p.m. to 7.30 a.m. Uh, in two years. There are parents shaking their period. fists at you right now. If they're not doing it directly, they're inside their mind. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, with that, my friend, again, appreciate you so much. Um, you know, like we were talking about guitars. Uh, if, if we do wind up getting together in person, we'd love to jam. Uh, and, and with that, uh, Kat, I'm going to turn it over to you, my dear friend, for some calls to action. Awesome sauce. Well, I dropped all of the um, wonderful fun we're going to have next mm. weekend with Ezra. I dropped those links in the chat again. Um, Tuesdays are Town Hall Tuesdays. So for the next two Tuesdays, I dropped links in for you. Next Tuesday, we will be having a Town Hall with Washington State Senator Emily Randall, who is absolutely our lead voice in the state on reproductive justice. We hope you will all join us. That link is in the chat. And then second, the week following, we have our girl, PJ, Pramila Jayapal yep, yep. on October 11th. One of our the very best. favorite people in the world is going to be joining us to bring us on home. Uh, ballots drop two days after that town hall to get all of us energized for that last little bit of getting out the vote. And also, I want to drop one, one last plug. My friends, our friends down at Olympia Indivisible are hosting a What's Next for Reproductive Justice um, so you can learn what you can do to uh, help after the fall of Roe v. Wade. That is on Thursday, October 6th at 7 p.m. It'll be 90 minutes, and the bit.ly is in the chat. That's it. Kat, would you mind if we just uh, came off of mute so we can give uh, Ezra a round of applause? And Nina, and Nina, please. And, and, and Nina. Nina as well. Yeah. We could do 
a state happy birthday with you on the ukulele, but maybe we should do that now to sing happy birthday. I'll bring the balloon. I don't know if it'll survive that long, uh, but to sing happy birthday, you have to join us for cupcakes and fun. Uh, uh, it's going to be fun. <laughs> Lisa, can, Lisa can play fiddle, so we're really going to have a pickup. Pick up yeah. Disaster on Zoom. Let's <laughs> Okay, no singing, but Stefan can definitely play. Thank you so uh, much, everybody, for we, joining us. We love you all. Thank you so much for being here tonight, y'all. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Really great. See you soon. See you and soon. We'll see you soon, Ezra.